Hello everyone and welcome! Back in the good old days of Journal of Justice, League used to be filled with stories going all over the place. With the summoners being practically gods of the old world, Riot felt free to create champions without any boundaries or reason. It didn't matter how ridiculous the story of a champion would be, the ending would be always the same. The summoners would summon the champions into an arena so they wouldn't kill anyone innocent in Runeterra. As a result of this world building, some of the lore in the old League of Legends universe was out of hand when compared to today's patiently structured storytelling. Today I want to show you 5 funny outdated stories that used to be real. And to make sure that you're not confused in the future, try not to remember anything you'll hear today. Everything we are going to talk about is not canon anymore, which means it is old and it is not real. Also, I will comment on these stories as we read them, because some of the moments here are priceless. I may make fun of some of them, so just remember, these stories were not written by writers or narrators. They were written by, at the time, the programmers and game designers. I am not making fun of them, because I know that their talents are very valuable elsewhere. But it is funny regardless. So let's get started. Not only are all of these stories quite short, but they always avoid all reason. Things usually happen just because. An excellent example of this was Nidalee's story. There are few dwellers, let alone champions, residing in the blasted and dangerous lands that lie south of the Great Barrier. Keep in mind that these stories are based on the old locations. Much of that world still bears the scars of past rune wars, especially the mysterious Kumungu jungle. There are long forgotten treasures in these strange places, which many risk life and limb to acquire. The champion known as Nidalee was only a young girl traveling with her treasure-seeking parents when they lost their way in the dense rainy jungles. The jungle was unforgiving, and she watched her parents suffer agonizing final days as they fell victim to a mysterious and vicious disease. As improbable as it was for a child to survive in the inhospitable jungle by herself, she did just that. Ah, uh, yeah. Remember when I said that Riot never needed a reason for anything to be the way it is? A normal child, alone, in the deadliest place on Runeterra. Surely there is no way she could have survived. But she did just that. You can tell that Riot became much better at storytelling. These days, this would have never gotten through. You need to explain how she overcame the obstacles in order to make a believable character. She hid in the caverns, she ate the moss, she drank from the leaves, give me anything. Nope, she did just that. But don't worry, the story is getting better. Her youthful innocence and a fortunate naivety caused her to appeal to the beasts of that place. And she was taken in by a family of cougars that raised her as one of their own. I know that this is a popular Disney thing to do, but let's be real. She would get ripped apart by any beast in any place where survival was the most important thing. But let's go with it for now. She grew and somehow absorbed the raw magic of the dense wilds, evolving beyond both her human physiology and her feline affectation. How? Why? What? She grew and somehow absorbed the raw magic of the dense wilds. She didn't get killed by the disease or turned into an abomination like the old Trundle, no, she somehow absorbed it. Somehow, I don't know how, don't ask me. It just happened, she did just that. But there is one more part to the story. On one pivotal day in her life, standing over the torn remnants of a Noxian squad of woodcutters, Nidalee chose to rejoin the so-called civilized world, to fight in the League of Legends so as to protect the vast woods from both Demacia and Noxus. In other words, one day she probably killed few Noxians and thought, Hmm, maybe I should go to these people which I know nothing of. And maybe I should join the League of Legends which I probably don't even know exists. Because, by the way, I was raised by cougars. And that was the old Nidalee. But don't worry because there are a few more gems around the old lore. So let's have a look at Tariq. There is an ancient form of magic, forgotten by many and discarded by some. It is the magic of the earth, of the resonance of crystals and gems. Tariq's father was a healer in their city, on a world far away. So, in case you didn't know, Tariq was an alien from another world. Tariq was always interested in his father's pursuits, even from a young age. Despite his burgeoning understanding of herbs, plants and animal medicines, 
It was the power of gems that most fascinated the growing boy. It wasn't long before Tariq has exhausted his father's coveted library and set out on a path of his own. He wasn't to be a healer, but a defender. One who used the power of the earth to preserve and protect. Again, no reason by the way. He was, and I quote, interested in his father's pursuits. But then, for no reason, he thought, I don't want to be a healer anymore. I want to help people by smashing other people. Quickly Tariq became a wandering knight, renowned across the land. What made him renowned, we don't know. That is, until the day a spell of summoning grabbed him from his home and deposited him on Runeterra. Now Tariq misses his world, though he is happy to fight in the league, protecting all who are needed. <clears throat> he was ripped from his own world, placed on a different world on the other side of the galaxy, where he didn't know anyone or anything, and he is fine with it. He misses his world, but he is happy to help the people he never saw and therefore he never trusted. Why was he not enraged? Why didn't he argue with the summoners to send him back? As it is common in these stories, we don't know. So let's have a look at another beautiful story. The story of Ramas. Ravaged by Rune Wars long past, the lands south of the Great Barrier are wrecked by chaotic magical storms, leaving the grasp of nature's rule tenuous at best. While abnormal flora and fauna are the norm rather than the exception in these ruined areas, Perhaps none is more curious than the case of Ramas. While no one is entirely certain why the armadillo from the Shuriman Desert crossed the Kumungu jungle and into the plague jungles, Ramas made just such a journey. This can't be real. I am not making this up. Nidalee did just that. And Ramas made just such a journey. We don't know why, who cares, am I right? People just did that, don't ask me stupid questions. I don't know what to think. They just did it. There, amongst the twisted veins and festering rot, he came across an oddity, a healthy evergreen hedge maze, stretching as far as the eye could see. As he explored the maze, something compelled him towards its center, a light, a presence of some kind. As he drew closer, the light surged, blinding him and knocking him unconscious. When he awoke, Ramus's whole world had changed. The maze had vanished and he felt truly cognizant for the first time in his otherwise unremarkable life. At least we know something about Ramas now. His life was unremarkable. As his predicament dawned on him, Ramas had a moment of panic. As he trembled, the earth around him began to shake, the intensity increasing until he managed to steady himself. As the quake receded, Ramas arose and left the plague jungles in search of others like him. Others like him? Was he lost? Maybe he shouldn't have traveled across the world for no reason. Oh, it's talking about whatever he learned from the light that we don't know anything about. Okay, let's continue. His search brought him across all the lands south of the Great Barrier, but everywhere he went, he was unique. The hardships of this sojourn inspired him to craft the suit of armor that would earn him the title of Spiked Shell Armadillo. Wait a second. Let's just ignore the fact that he just crafted himself armor, somehow, with his own tiny hands. An armadillo which lived its entire life as an animal. His spiked shell was an armor? This entire time? So he was naked? Now that's a skin I wanna see. Ramos's quest eventually drew him to the only place where a sentient armadillo is less that confounding. The League of Legends. And that's where Ramos's story ended. To sum it up, he just did things that we don't know anything about and nothing happened. Now let's have a look at the first iteration of Teemo. Captain of the Bandle City Scouts, Timo is the foremost defender of the Yordl homeland. In addition to his duties as a scout leader, which include planning the Soapbox Derby, teaching new recruits the Scouts Pledge, and judging the yearly Samore Eating Contest, Timo is also responsible for the defense of the Bandle City itself. In Timo's best selling autobiography, Accuracy by Volume, the leader of the Bandle City Scouts expounds on Yordle military tactics such as a blow dart carpet bombing and filling trebuchets with poison tipped sewing needles. Wow, carpet bombing and throwing needles at people? Now I wanna see what the book was about. Though he can often be found in the courtyard outside the practice arena signing copies of his book, Timo is really at the League of Legends for another reason. He has come as the emissary for the entire Yordle nation, to petition the Institute of War to start a new type of tournament. His proposition includes wood carving, 
rope bridge building and campfire cooking to the list of approved forms of combat sanctioned inside the league. So far he hasn't had much luck. What is even happening here? On one line he is using carpet bombings against his enemies and on another line he says he prefers to carve wood instead of fighting to resolve his problems. And that's how his story ends. He was a proper maniac then. And maybe he is now too, we don't know. Anyway, let's have a look at the last one. Soraka. Soraka, the star child of Ionia, was the first of her kind. While there are many who tap into the rich magical energies of Valoran, she was one of the first to tap into the magic of the cosmos. Reaching beyond the terrestrial firmament, Soraka was capable of invoking the power of the stars, evolving beyond her kind. That is, until she let the most primal of her emotions rule her. Vorik, a mercenary chemist in the service of Noxus, had caused untold suffering and death among Soraka's people. Unstoppable anger and hatred welled within her and she cursed the man to become a beast. Soraka lost much of her power for this misstep, sliding several steps down in the evolutionary ladder in an instant. Though she is still a champion for the Ionian people, Soraka has joined the League of Legends in hopes of reversing her curse and redeeming herself in the eyes of the stars. This was her full story. It's not that bad, right? I mean, she could have killed Warwick instead of cursing him, but that doesn't really matter that much. But what does matter is that evolution thingy happening. The story said that when she was blessed by the stars, she evolved beyond her kin. Presumably she turned into one of the Celestials. When she then used the stars as a weapon, she slid down few evolutionary steps. That's why she was something between a unicorn and a human. And since we know that Soraka was a hybrid of the two, this means that the pure celestial beings were unicorns. Since the bottom of the evolution was a human and the middle was a unicorn crossover, the highest evolution stage had to be pure unicorn. And with this revelation, I want to end this video. The purpose of this was to show you that Riot became a lot better at storytelling. Now they always tell you why things are happening. And when they don't, it usually has a foreshadowing purpose. But to be fair, the first versions of Champion's lore was usually quite empty because Riot wanted to expand it with the Journal of Justice. However, the Journal of Justice focused more on the conflicts between the regions, so not a lot has usually changed. But that's it for this video. So if you enjoyed it, feel free to rate the video and subscribe for more lore. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Discord if you'd like to chat. The links to our awesome merch and the second channel will be in the description. And of course, my thanks goes to the patrons. Thank you guys so much for going the extra mile. And with that, thank you all so much for being here and for your support. You know I really appreciate it. And as always, thank you come again.